They wore full Arctic gear, cooked on portable stoves, exercised with their packs on their backs, and ate the rations they really would have carried into the far north. It wasn't long before the study came up with a surprising cold temperature diet effect. Scientific measurements of calorie intake, heat loss, and energy needs all showed one thing clearly. No matter how much the men ate, they were steadily losing weight. They didn't have to feel uncomfortable. At all times, they were warmly dressed and protected from any damage from the extreme cold. But somehow, their bodies responded to the chilled air by turning on a physical furnace and burning up extra calories. This effect may be why most of us have such good appetites on cold days, and why skiers really enjoy a hearty meal after an invigorating day on the slopes. Of course, you do have to exercise. Nobody's suggesting that any time you want to lose a few pounds, you simply turn down your thermostat. But when the next cold spell arrives, you might be able to take advantage of it. Who knows? By exercising outdoors, even in woolies and furs, you may be able to eat all you want and still whittle your waistline at the same time. <laughs> You are looking at water survival training for future astronauts, preparing them for splashdown when they return to Earth. Each man is towed behind a launch until his parasail lifts him high into the air, and he can learn both air control and water safety at the same time. Oil rigs are built on land with three enormous legs that will reach to the sea bottom. But while the rig is being towed into position at sea, the three legs are jacked up out of the water and stick up high in the air. Such a floating rig is enormously heavy and poorly balanced while the legs are up. It may have to be towed halfway around the world, but it will only move through the water very slowly. In the oil business, doing anything slowly soon costs thousands of dollars. So, in an astonishing attempt to speed up the towing rate, the chairman of the Rowan Company in Texas decided to try setting sails on the oil rig itself. Two tremendous sails were fashioned out of super strong Dacron, sails sewn together with six miles of stitching. Spread out on the ground, they could cover a football field. Two soaring steel masts were fitted onto the oil rig's front leg, and rigging that could have tied up a herd of elephants was neatly attached and put in place. On a normal racing yacht, a little metal fastening called a toggle would weigh about 10 pounds. On the huge oil rig, the same mechanism ended up weighing 250 pounds. The sails themselves weighed more than two tons each, and when they were unfurled, they stretched 180 feet into the air. The result is enough to make even world-class racing yachts look like so many children's toys. Sea tests of the giant rigging show that when the oil rig was under sail, its speed did increase, indicating that over long distances, the saving in time would be considerable. Never in all the history of sailing have there been sails of these dimensions. But then, never in all the history of sailing has there ever been such an unusual ship. <laughs> New clothes, even the most up-to-date styles, have an interesting link with the past. They are all made of fabrics woven on machinery, which has hardly changed in the hundred years since it was invented. Weaving looms very much like this one played a major part in the Industrial Revolution. And there's a reason why they haven't changed. Until now, even the most modern technology has found it very difficult to develop a way to do such an awkward job any faster or more smoothly. Alternate sets of threads must be pulled apart to make way for the flying shuttle, and then the threads are pounded into place by a beater like a heavy piston. The very mechanics of the task seem to indicate that weaving couldn't be done any faster, or the whole thing might fly apart. But now an English inventor has developed a revolutionary new loom, and a demonstration at slow speed shows some startling differences. Instead of a heavy pounding noise, there's a hiss as compressed air blows the loosened threads apart. Then the odd-shaped rotors turn, the loose threads tighten, and the other set of threads are blown apart. All at once, most of the clumsy machinery is gone, along with most of the noise. Even the heavy beater is no longer needed, because in this loom, the cloth itself moves up and down, forcing its own threads neatly into place. The whole operation has become so much smoother, it can safely be speeded up until it's too fast for the eye to follow. A test run produces some very surprising statistics. 
This astonishing new loom can actually interweave the threads at a speed of 2,000 times a minute. That's more than five times the speed of even the fastest old-style loom. The experimental model is only on a small scale, but with the proof of the method comes the promise of full-size looms that will work just as smoothly and just as fast. The principle will be the same, odd-shaped rotors and puffs of compressed air in a machine that has finally left the past behind and caught up with today's more swiftly moving world. Anybody with an earache is more concerned with the pain they feel than with any danger to their hearing, and yet an earache can be the warning sign of dangerous infection. Sometimes an ear infection is hidden in the middle ear, the small chamber that holds the tiny bones that vibrate to the sounds we hear. The doctor must clear out the middle ear to leave it clean and healthy, but the only way in is through the eardrum, and that's a little door that always remains closed. In the past, doctors have actually drilled a tiny hole in the eardrum and then inserted miniature tubes to drain the infected chamber. It wasn't a comfortable procedure, but it was sometimes necessary in order to save the patient from becoming deaf. Once the ear had been cleared, the little tubes could be withdrawn, and after a time, the eardrum would heal, closing the tiny hole. But the procedure of making the hole was painful, and if the patient were a child, a general anesthetic was needed before he could be helped. No doctor wants to give a child a full anesthetic for a relatively minor procedure. But now physicians at Stanford University Medical Center have finally developed a painless way to make the little hole. They turn to the laser beam, one of modern science's most amazing tools. By adding a foot pedal control to a CO2 laser, the Stanford surgeons were able to leave both hands free to position their new instrument, aiming it into the patient's affected ear so that it's right on target, on the eardrum. With this method, the only anesthetic needed can be in solution and simply poured right into the ear canal. The laser beam cuts like a scalpel, but can be adjusted to make exactly the right size tiny hole. What's more, the doctor doesn't need to insert any tubes because the little laser hole stays open for nearly a month and then heals up very nicely all by itself. You might say this laser technique for draining the middle ear is one way of shedding a new light on an old problem. You are looking at the automated assembly of one of the world's most advanced aircraft radar systems. This amazing robot machinery makes intricate computer components, installing tiny circuit chips with blinding speed and tireless precision. Factory chimneys are no longer allowed to fill the air with uncontrolled amounts of smoke. But even when limits are set by law, how do you monitor drifting gases? Airborne pollution is not easy to trace. You have to get your equipment up there just to take a measurement. Well, that's what experts in Britain are doing right now. They're sending up a model airplane that works as an important research tool by flying right through the smoke plume from a factory chimney. But this is no ordinary model plane. It is remote controlled and it also has some very unusual features. For instance, it contains such sophisticated equipment that it needs radar, a computer and a whole team of scientists to operate it. By taking air samples above and near the smokestack, they learn what the pollutants are and whether or not the pollutants released are within acceptable limits. Throughout the flight of the little craft, a microprocessor collects information from sensors fitted on the plane information about temperature, humidity, and concentration of pollutants. A tiny transmitter sends all the facts back down to a receiver on the ground. Being readied for one of its special flights, the small plane is fitted with filters that will trap airborne particles for later analysis. The plane's short flight path will carry it through the smoke plume and then downwind to the chimney so that the smoke and gases can be carefully traced as they disperse. The radar unit tracks the craft itself while its constant stream of radio signals is analyzed by a computer and matched up with its position in the sky. On a graph, a pen charts a steady line, the sign of unpolluted air. But as the plane flies into the plume of gases, a sudden curve shows the change and flattens out again as the small craft re-enters clear air. Suddenly, pollution that until now has been uncharted and hard to track is caught, focused and measured. The first steps in keeping it truly under control. 
The sturdy small aircraft may have been designed originally as part of an absorbing hobby, but used in this way, it takes its place as a valuable scientific tool to help preserve the delicate balance between nature and industry in our modern world. There's a serious noise and vibration problem in every factory which must use huge power hammers and other heavy noisy equipment. Various anti-vibration systems have been tried and have had only limited success. But now two Japanese companies have come up with something that really seems to work. Their new anti-vibration system works by turning the whole factory floor into a floating platform. But it's not floating on water, it's floating on the air held in a series of pneumatic rubber cushions. The cushions are placed both underneath the floor and along each side, where the floor would otherwise bump against the walls. As a result, both vibration and sway are cut down to the minimum. Now, even when heavy machinery crowds the floor, the noise is still successfully kept below the environment protection standard noise level set by the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. The new system has already been put to good use in a forging factory set right in the middle of one of Tokyo's most densely populated areas. It was certainly badly needed, both by the workers in the factory and by the people who live nearby. Well, after only a short test period, there was no doubt that the floating floor could dramatically reduce both noise and vibration. It turned out to be a winner on all counts. The floating floor had been easy to install and was also easy to maintain. The air pressure in the durable rubber cushions is adjusted automatically so that even when heavy machinery is moved, everything stays on an even keel. Who would ever have expected to see a factory able to take the noise out of heavy machinery so easily, simply floating its floor on an astonishing cushion of air? Although you might not think that toys could be very important in the treatment of a handicapped child, it seems they might be just what the doctor ordered. Researchers for the United Cerebral Palsy Association are using a combination of toys and biofeedback to help handicapped children gain coordination, balance, and control. For example, the magic light pen is wired to stay lit as long as it remains on a special blue path. But if the child lets it stray off the path, the little light near his fingers goes out. Young Tony concentrates very hard, and when he reaches the end of the maze, he has a feeling of real accomplishment. And as he gets better at the task, both he and the therapist can see that his coordination is improving. Another special toy, this one called Space Control, uses a joystick that must be firmly grasped and moved. Little Kathy tries her best to control the spot of light on the TV screen. If she loosens her grip, the light hides behind the paper. It's fun, and it's a game, but it's also teaching her motor control and helping her to build up the strength of the muscles in hand and arm. Little Pia has a hard time holding up her head. She even has difficulty in knowing when it's upright. But researchers have made her a special helmet that works like a carpenter's level. It measures the position of Pia's small head. There's an electronic link between her special helmet and the little electric train. Pia loves the train, and her helmet allows her to become chief engineer. When her head is in the upright position, the train runs swiftly around the track. But if her little head droops down, the train stops. Only lifting her head will get the engine running again. The researchers hope that such conscious repetition will teach Pia's muscles to obey her mind. And the same principle may help other children with learning disabilities to improve their motor skills. With toys such as these, researchers are learning to turn therapy time into playtime. And as for the children, well, without even realizing it, they are learning how to control their muscles, and that's the most important lesson of all. You are looking at winter sports enthusiasts keeping in top form all year round by skiing on the grass. Their neat little grass skis travel on a continuous caterpillar track, and sometimes the skier moves even faster on the grass than he did on the snow. There are many dangers on a busy highway, but at night one of the greatest dangers is a car that has stopped because it has had some sort of a breakdown. Other drivers hurrying through the gloom may not be able to see the stopped vehicle in time to avoid crashing into it. 
But now there's a little gadget that acts as an obvious warning to other cars. It's a little roadside emergency device that you keep stowed neatly in your trunk, as long as it is not needed. However, when it is needed, whenever your car must stop on the highway after dark, the little device is ready. Three small arms, each one holding a reflector, are connected to a central rod. One reflector is red, one is amber, and one is white. And they rotate around the central rod. The gadget has a magnetic base that holds it firmly on the roof, hood, or trunk of your car. And the power of the wind is all it takes to set it in motion. There are no electrical connections at all. It's true that you already have reflectors built into the taillights of your car, but they are stationary. On a parked car, they may get dirty or splashed or covered with snow and may not show up very well if it's dark or rainy. But the emergency reflectors seem to flash in the lights of an approaching car. Rotating in the wind, they flash red, then amber, and then white. They're a real attention getter, and as long as there's even a gentle breeze, they continue to turn and flash in the approaching headlights. With this emergency unit in place, your own car is much safer, and as well, there's far less danger of a tragic pileup of cars whose drivers didn't see your car in time to stop. The rotary reflector system gives everyone the advantage of a danger signal, so obvious it cannot be missed. Modern man is familiar with at least the idea of weightlessness, the zero gravity that allows orbiting astronauts to float around inside their spacecraft. But did you know that the condition of weightlessness can be used to benefit us all? It's all because of the effect that gravity has on Earth-based experiments. For instance, on Earth, solid materials are easy to collect. The scientists could soon start culturing large quantities of the correct cells, and then the enzyme producers could be returned to Earth to complete their important job in normal gravity. That's just one job for Space Lab. There's no doubt that biologists and medical researchers will soon discover many uses for the... And finally, one last word. Do you know someone who has trouble getting to work on time because he lingers too long over his coffee or paper, long after he should have left? Well, now there's a stink bomb alarm system from an Iowa inventor that is guaranteed to get him on his way. Five minutes before he should be out of the door, a hurry-up buzzer warns him that time is running short, and if he doesn't leave on time, he'll be sprayed by a skunk-flavored aerosol bomb. Only locking the door from the outside turns the device off, at least until next morning at the same time. What will they think of next? Until next time, this is Joseph Campanella and Kerry Keene for Science International.